Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Um, so it's a pleasure to introduce Ping Li, who's back once again to MSR. He's done three internships with us, uh, two with Ken Church and one with me. He's fin finishing his PhD at the Statistics Department at Stanford with Trevor Hasty, and he's done lots of work on dimensional reduction and stuff like that, and that's what he's going to talk about today. There are some spare slots if anybody wants to talk to him um, who's not already, so just see me after the talk and we will arrange that. Thanks. All right. Thank you for coming. So my pleasure to be here. Thanks, Chris. Oh, I need to do this. OK, so today I'm going to talk about two methods for approximating distances. One is called stable random projection. Another method is called conditional random samplings. And uh, I'd like to thank my uh, this is advisor, Trevor Hasty, and uh, the collaborator is Ken. So, so, let, so let's start with the, with the slides. Now, we are lucky or unlucky in the era of modern massive data sets. And uh, part of the talk about a quarter was presented in a workshop uh, this summer, uh, before the summer. And the workshop was, uh, the goal of the workshop is to bridge the goal, uh, bridge the gap between the numerical learning algebra, theoretical computer science, and data applications. And it was quite successful. It had a lot more participants than what we an originally anticipated. Most of them from Yahoo and Google because it was at Stanford. So this is our two sentences that we everybody loves. You never pay to think until you run out of data. There's no data like more data. And the, oh, this one. So this is our favorite slides. And I won't tell you who, where the slide's coming from. But it basically says that if you, if you use more data, eventually you, uh, you're going to get more accuracies, and no matter what, which matter you're doing. Thanks, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Yeah. OK. So uh, there are two properties of larger data sets. So first, larger data sets are often highly sparse. And, and everyone knows that text data, most of the words only occur in less than 1% of the documents. And uh, so we should take advantage of that. And, uh, and uh, in, the summer, in the summer 2007, I will be giving another talk in a, in a session, the MS end of meetings on, sparse, on sparsity of high dimension problems. So another property of larger data sets is that data sets are often highly, highly heavy tailed. Uh, so this goes back to our Prato rules, uh, Prato principle, like 80%, 20, 80, 20 rules. It says 80% of the population owns, 20% uh, 20, 20 of the population owns 80% of the money. This is probably not true in Microsoft. But and we have many examples. Is it true or not true? <laughs> well. So heavy tail data brings challenges, both challenges and opportunities to learning and to business and to information retrieval. So, so this is a, let's see. OK, so this is a cover page of a book. It tells you how to do business use, uh, using the long tail distributions. That means so, uh, numerous number of tra small transactions well, in, in the end, bring you lots of fortunes because of, because of heavy tail. So what the heavy tail data really look like? So, so heavy, tail, heavy tail data are usually modeled by like Prato distributions with parameter eta. So the probability density of, of Prato is this power law form. That's why it's also called power law distributions. And if we plot the probability density with different eta values, we can see that compared with the normal curve, which drops really quickly, so the tail of the distributions become really relatively flat, even at very large the value of x. And an important property of uh, this Prato distribution is that if a gamma is larger than eta, it, it doesn't have moments. And uh, but if a gamma less than less than eta, then it has finite gamma moments. So there many people did measurements of eta. Like uh, this is from the new paper. And uh, we can see that lots of the values are between 1 and 2, maybe slightly less than 1, but slightly larger than 2. 
a range in, in that range. So this, this shows that most of the data points, most of the data sets, they do not have bounded for second moments because eight has less than two. But most of the data sets, they have at least bounded first moments because eight has larger than one for most of the data sets. And so this, this also means in terms of moments, we can talk about uh, the norms. We can also talk about norms. So that means L2 norm, which is the Euclidean distance, is often do not make sense in most of data sets. But the L1 norm, which is also known as a Manhattan distance, are usually meaningful. And uh, so that, therefore, today's talk, I'm going to talk about uh, three, different, uh, three different topics. The first topic is about using stable random projections to approximate the L alpha norms, alpha between 0 and 2. It's a very theoretical opinion. And I'm going to show a little bit about theoretical results for, for that topic. But uh, what we really like is the idea of very sparse stable random projections, which improve the efficiency very considerably. And uh, both of these results have not been published and uh, submitted to the preprint server. And, uh, but the prior work is called Very Sparse Random Projections, and it's published in KDD. And, uh, but I won't talk about that today, since I'm more excited about the new results. So, <laughs> Uh, so the, the another, another algorithm is called conditional random sampling. And uh, we developed a, a, a while was intern here. It uh, often actually works better than random projections because it takes advantage of data sparsity. And, uh, and uh, we like it because it uses the same sketches for many different tasks, for many different summary statistics. And it has a strong connection to broader uh, well-known algorithm called meanwhile sketches. So this is a gender. So this little bit of notation will always use a capital letter A like a, to denote a data matrix of so n rows and d columns. That means n data points and d dimensions. So some examples like a turn document matrix. So n is number of words and d is number of docu uh, documents. And uh, n and d can be huge. And uh, we'll have this customer product matrix. And we also have this, uh, everybody, uh, a lot of people excited about the million dollar price machine learning task to do a user movie rating. and. Uh, and also the image pixel matrix or gene expression microarray data. So just a little bit review of the distances. And so, so the pairwise distances are fundamental. Now for example, the L alpha distance, which is basically the, basically the absolute difference raised to the alpha power and sum over all coordinates. And uh, we also, everybody loves the, coordinate, uh, the inner product or cosine distance, which is a normalized inner product or center cosine inner product. Uh, cos center cosine distance, which is a correlation distance, or chi-square and mutual informations. And in some application, we care also about the motorway distances, which is also called, yeah, like uh, motorway intersections. Uh, motorway intersections, okay. So there are lots of numerous applications based on distances, like classification, clustering, duplicate removal, the nearest neighbors, recommender system, data database query optimizations, Retrieval and the kernels, they're all about distances. So, before we're talking about some challenges, so the first question, basic question is what distance should we use? And uh, it also means which norm should, should I work with? And we, everybody loves to use L2 distance. Like, and the many of the statistical models and learning models they assume normal or normal like, like it has bounded second moments. But our world is not normal. We're unfortunately or fortunately to live in an abnormal world. So what should we do? Because the L2 distance doesn't make sense in most of the data sets. So, so people do like, what people do is, uh, well, we just love L2 norm. So let's stick with it. So let's, 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 must, let's maneuver the data. So let's turn away the data. And let's use, a, for example, use a square root of data or take a logarithm or the binary quantize the data. Or the second solution is uh, let's use L alpha norm, alpha less than two. Or some, for example, we know that L1 norms are usually meaningful for most of data sets, so let's use that. Or just let's use any other alpha that can be as a tuning parameter. That, so there's a hybrid approach too. So CV, CHV, V stands for Vapnik, just for name recognition. This suggests the SVM kernel in this form. So inside the, inside the explain show, the, the, the kernel meet basically the alpha distance uh, on the weighted data. And they say, well, alpha equal 0.5 sometimes works best for that specific task. So, so this is a, 
so some background information. Why do we care about L alpha distances? So let's now talk about some, challenge, some computational challenges in distance-based methods. So the first challenge is the data often too large to fit in the physical memory. So we do need a compact data representation. And sometimes, if you want to compute the OPI-wise distances, it just, excuse me, it's not feasible. And uh, for multi-ways, for, uh, for, for pair-wise, but for multi-way, sometimes it's just getting worse. It's just, it's just getting worse. And in some application, like database applications, we care, absolutely care about the, about the speed. For example, we want to use some quick and dirty estimates or joins and to, to do a query planning. So obviously, you want this estimates to be, to be done really quickly, uh, better, much quicker than executing the, the actual plans. And uh, there's a, uh, another problem is a massive data stream problem. I'm not sure that's uh, uh, a problem in Microsoft, but in some other company like at and it's a big problem because it has lots of uh, network traffic and highway traffic and like, weather conditions, finance data. And the data is so large, sometimes you don't even store the data. You just store the summary statistics. So uh, computing the summary statistic and updating it becomes uh, challenging and uh, in some area of data management. So, okay. so, so now the first solution for, that ch for dealing with the massive data sets uh, is that let's do random coordinate sampling. So instead of, instead of uh, using, dealing with the data matrix with D columns, which D is a huge, so let's do uh, a subsample. That means we choose K out of D columns from data matrix and uh, get, a, get a small reduced matrix called A, a tilde. And then we just approximate any, any of the summary statistics by, uh, by the sample summary statistic multiplied by scale. So this is good. It's because it's simple and so people use it every day, I guess. And it's another thing people like is because it can be reused for approximating all kinds of distances. So one, one samples for all. So, so this is great. But it has been criticized over and over because the error is very large. And even when the data are slightly the model, a slightly heavy tailed. The error is quite large. I mean, we're talking about the variance. And when, when we're working with sparse data, the most samples will be zeros uh, if you fix the number of columns. So that's the that's two main criticism for uh, random coordinate sampling. Let's, uh, let's see why the variance is very large. And then, so let's look at an example. So suppose you have x1 and xd. Uh, uh, co uh, coordinates, and you randomly pick k out of d elements, and estimate the original L alpha norm. Then the variance will be in this form. If I uh, hope you can be convinced this is true, because the variance, think about variance of x is e x square minus e x the whole thing square. So, and this, because we're working with the L alpha norm, about this term is raised to the two alpha power. That means it's the dominating term when the variance. Uh, when the data are heavy tailed. So it, it is a killer. <laughs> so the, the, the numerous ways how to remove this heavy tail and the impact of the heavy tail. And uh, we're going to discuss, discuss about two methods. One's called stable random projections. Another method is called conditional random sampling to, re to, to, to reduce the variance. So using stable random projection, this is just an advertisement. I'm going to show you the results later again. So stable random projection, so the variance becomes this form. So instead of this two alpha, I don't have the two alpha anymore. So remove the variance, and with the, the C is a small constant. So, which, so, so that's why people are excited about it, because you remove the, heavy, the impact of heavy tailedness. So, so people think that's great. Okay, so and, and, but we like this algorithm even better. We call conditional random sampling. It, after, after and our algorithm, has the same form of variance as regular random coordinate sampling, except it multiply multiplicative term of sparsity, which is uh, sometimes often less than 0.01 in some applications. So both app, both methods reduce the variance compared with the random coordinate sampling in different ways. And whether or not CRS is better than SRP depends on how heavy is the data and how sparse is the data. So there's no con conclusive answer except in the Boolean data. Which is also which is, a, which is not so sparse, which is sparse and also not very heavy tail. We know that conditional random sampling is way better than stable random projections. Okay, 
just some. Okay, so, let, so let's start with the stable random projections. So stable random projection, the idea is uh, not that compli not it's not that complicated. Means uh, we have a big matrix A, and we don't like it because it's too big. So let's multiply that with a small matrix, small skinny matrix R, and we get another skinny matrix B. So B is uh, we call it projected data matrix. So R is a projection matrix. So the entries of R are random in the sense that each, each element of R, they're samples of alpha stable distribution. And so when alpha is equal to 2, that's normal. Let me use normal samples. When alpha is 1, that's Cauchy. And the, the projected data contains enough information to reconstruct the L alpha distance in A. And our contribution here is that we provide a, a good estimator to recover the distance and its variance and bounds and uh, this JL type of lemmas for all alpha. So this is the new theoretical results. And the, but we like the idea of very sparse stable random projections because this, that, this multiplication is going to be very expensive and we don't want to do that. Uh, at, least we, at least we want to do that in a more efficient way. So, so, so I'm going to talk about that too. All right. So before I get into the theoretical results, let's, let's talk about some experiments. Uh, so this is an experiment on classifying the gene expression, gene micro, microarray data. Here, my, my data is not too large. It has only 176 uh, data points in 12,600 dimensions. It's considered a high dimension, you, you, even though it's not, very, not too high. So the, the, the data points belong to three different classes, two in the cancers, two cancer classes, and one normal samples. And if we do like using the L2 correlation distance and, and the nearest neighbor classifier, you're going to make like a four to six mistakes out of, one, out of 176. But if we use the L1 distance, the error is much, much smaller. So, so this is just an example shows, well, L1 distance works better than L2. Okay? But what we're going to do is that we're going to do stable random projections. That means we have the data and we multiply that with a random matrix. R, and uh, this, the dimension of R is 12,600 multiplied by K, K ranging from 5 to 400. And then we're going to do two different kinds of experiments. One is a stable random projection. That means in this case, uh, one case is Cauchy. So, so R has Cauchy entries in one experiment. Another experiment, R has this uh, strange distributions, which is a mixture of Prato. We already seen Prato. And it was with lots of zeros in the middle. And uh, we can see that we, when the beta is very small, like 0.01, that means 99% of them are zeros. So, so we're going to do, do both experiments. Then we just estimate the or, original L1 distance in A from the projected data B. Using the estimator I'm going to talk about later. And then we do the classification, your five nearest neighbor, and using L1 distance, using the estimated L1 distance. And then we repeat the experiment 100 times and averages a curve. So this is what we get. So this is, so let's, so this contains lots of information. So the horizontal axis means the sample size. That means how much work you do. And the, the vertical axis is the, the misclassification errors. And you want no errors, and you want, you, ideally you want no errors and no work. You want it here, <laughs> which, is, which is not possible. So, so we have to do some work. And this horizontal line means, uh, means using the old 12,000 dimensions, you get two errors. Okay? So, and this, this curve, the, the dash curve, the, Cauchy, the, the red curve, the Cauchy curve, means using Cauchy and the projections. And uh, you reduce the dimension from 12,600 to about 100 dimensions. And uh, you, the errors are, as are comparable. It's relatively small. So this is good. The Cauchy random projection can reduce the dimension very considerably without hurting the performance a lot. So now the three curves called beta corresponding to this, this type of uh, projections, the sparse projections. And we can see that the beta equal to 0.01 is still overlap with the Cauchy. That means we get a hundredfold speed up compared with the Cauchy and the projections without hurting the performance. 
of course, if you do like a little bit too extreme, like 0 0.001, you're going to see some difference. But still, uh, but yeah, but still, it's not, it's not too, much, too much difference. Can you say something about the fraction of components that you're ignoring with those different values of beta? Uh, the fraction is, uh, is uh, the fraction is uh, one minus beta. So beta is a uh, beta is a uh, for example beta is a point oh one. Thank you. Beta is a point one means that ninety nine percent of the projected of the projection matrix are are zeros. So you're ignoring ninety nine percent of the. 99, yeah, I'm ignoring ninety nine percent. I still get yeah, comparable results. I mean, actually overlapping results. Yeah. So there must be a huge amount of redundancy in this data set. Yes. Yes. That's uh, yeah. That's another way to look at it. Yeah. What was the variance? This is average over 100, right? right. Yeah, average of 100, yeah. And what was the variance? Uh, I did not look at the variance, yeah. All right, yeah, but it's, uh, the, the, actually, the, the variance is very small. When I, I, I look at it, but I did not record it. The variance is about, I think, the difference between like one or two uh, mis misclassification errors, usually, yeah. It's, it's Using the Pareto distribution there is very important. Like, if you use data distributions there for the R values, this would not. There is also be different. And the Pareto, you, yeah. well, you, uh, the reason that because we're working with the L1 distance, so you have to use uh, like they call like the the distribution. Pareto belongs to the family called like a stable distribution, like a domain of domain of uh, attraction family. So you have to use something like Pareto or something similar to do that. And you cannot use normal for for L1. Yeah. So this is for unsupervised projection. Uh, I unsupervised projection. Yeah. Oh. For example, if you were Chris Burgess, you would use uh, something like multiple discriminant analysis. Have you tried that? Even you might only get three dimensions out, but but you know, it, can you squeeze much harder if your projections were informed about the project, about the task you were trying to do instead of trying to do it at random? I haven't tried that, but I, I believe for this data set, since it works so well, that means I, I believe the uh, and the supervised will also give very good results. Yeah. Right, but it might do it dimensions you know, you know. yeah so yeah I yeah I should try that thank you I was just wondering how sort of beta could be before it broke actually so I guess it flips mm -hmm. on the same question how, how, how did you try and say different bees different beta how, how small can you choose it without uh, breaking? yeah the theoretical analysis is based on the like race of convergence analysis it's like generalized central limit theory how, how fast it grows when beta is small, the rates of convergence are very slow. So eventually, yeah, eventually it's going to break. <laughs> but, but you're saying that if beta equal one in a thousand, it's already broken. Uh, it broken. Yeah, it doesn't look well. well the, from here, I can't see it. But if I was in the front row, I could. <laughs> yeah, the, the reason that once you once you get it to 100 dimension, that means you you actually in in a way you 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 compensate that little beta values already. Yeah. Oh, so I mean to say, as the dimension gets actually very high, uh -huh. as the sample size gets high, in fact, things really aren't as be, aren't being as sparse as the beta is really implying. Uh huh. Is that, yeah. Is that what you're saying? I, I, I think that's one of the reasons. Yeah, because you, because you do the projection independently, so that means if you as as long as you sample enough, eventually you're going to touch every element. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. So you're evaluating this on a kind of classification. Yeah, yeah, nearest neighbor classification. And so, is nearest neighbor a good method for this? Are some other methods, you know, competitive? Uh, so I haven't tried. A hard, a hard classification problem. Uh, I, I guess it's not. Yeah, and I, but I haven't tried any other methods. So the 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 purpose to show this is to show that the Cauchy random projection works, and the the very sparse doesn't affect much of the performance. Yeah, but yeah, I consider this a toy example, so I did not try any other. I'll reformulate my question about the variance. What was the worst case? Because in this case, right, it could be that 99% of the time you get a good result. And once, with your random projections, you get uh -huh. a terrible result. But when you run it on real data, you only run it once. You don't average 100 times because you lose the advantage. Right? So what kind of guarantees do you have about the performance? Uh, well, there's no theoretical guarantees for, for classifications. There's theoretical, there's theoretical guarantees in terms of distances, but, but going from distance to classification is, is, another, is another procedure. There's no theoretical guarantees on that. 
So I, I, I'm going to talk about theoretical guarantees in terms of distance. Yeah, but th yeah, thank you. I, next time I'm going to plot the pose of variance on it. Yeah, if that's what. One quick question, the, the previous slide. Uh -huh. um, it's probably a dumb question, but why does scale R, why, why is it, why, you, why does using P matter? I could just scale R and get the same, you get a scale distance, right? All the P's change. I'm just missing why, why you have to choose between alpha and greater variable. Scale? Well, scale the R matrix. Okay. Uh, in the second case. Okay. Um, then P alpha goes to two P alpha. I mean, so your distances would would scale. Oh yeah, that's fine. Yeah, but you by doing the estimation, you have to you have to consider the scale scaling right in order to recover. Yeah, scaling is fine. Scaling that doesn't matter, I guess. Yeah, the the importance uh, is the sparsity. Yeah. Okay, maybe I, I go on. So. So a little bit of background on, on stable distributions. So stable distribution can be, so it's a density. You cannot usually write it down explicitly, except you can write it down in terms of Fourier transforms. So stable distribution has this Fourier transform, uh, alpha and d, means the alpha parameter is an index parameter, d is a scale parameter. I, I use a capital S to indicate that. And uh, so in two cases, we know, the, we know the Fourier transform mean. We know the inverse Fourier transform. So it's normal and a Cauchy. Can you just say something, so I presume that, that x to the i x t there is actually giving us what that's kind of like the frequency. So basically what we're looking at, what you're saying is in the frequency domain, uh -huh. the, the energy needs to drop off exponentially. Is that with yeah. frequency? Is that roughly what that's saying? Yeah, I think so. Where, where, where alpha is the... Is how fast it grows. Yeah. How fast, how fast it drops. Yeah. Exponential or by power law? It looks like power law to me. X. Yeah. Well, so there's an X sitting in front of this X. That's what I thought about exponential. Right. Yeah, right. Are you reading the formula? Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> like a. <laughs> so this is like about that Hasenberg's principle. Yeah, you can. You know, in one domain is a power law, in another domain it's not, right? It's exponential. So, so you cannot have both. So this is a, I think it's related to the has or the has Chris the has works principle, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So this is a so this is a normal, and this is a Cauchy. So normal is so Cauchy look like normal in the head, but the tail is much thicker. Okay. So what stable mean? Stable well, in terms of normal, uh, we probably very familiar with it because if you x is normal, and for any weights u, you you do a normal, uh, the weight is sound, it's still normal, but with the variance becoming the L2 norm of the vector u. So th that means, that, that means that after, after the summation, it's still normal. That's why it's called stable. But for general alpha, it still has a similar form, except the scale parameter instead of the L2 norm becomes the L alpha norm. So, so that's why it's called stable. And so therefore, this provides a natural mechanism to do dimension reductions. So, so, let's, so let's look at this figure again. So A is a range of the data matrix. R is a projection matrix, has this stable distributions. B is a projected data. So if we only look at the first two rows, the U1 and U2 in A, and the V1 and V2 in B, so they have this, this correspondence. So v, each V has K dimensions. So each dimension of V is a stable with scale parameter, in, I mean, with index parameter alpha, and the scale parameter being the L alpha norm in vector U1. And the, the difference, they're also distributed as uh, the same scale parameter, I mean, the same stable distribution with different scale parameter, which happen to be the L alpha distance between U1 and U2. So can I just check to see if I understand? So what you're saying there is that if all the variables in A are distributed according to uh, uh, this particular family, okay. S, the scale parameter with alpha, right, uh -huh. then B is going to be some linear combination of those variables, yes. and then that will then also belong to that same family. The variables in B will also belong yeah. to that same family. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, the linear combination you can see from here is a matrix multiplication. Yeah, right. yeah thank you. But only if you pick the right R. 
Uh, yeah, but for any R. You, no, I thought it was any R. I thought it was any linear combination. Yeah, any linear. It'll be a linear combination, but yeah. B wouldn't be stable if it was a long Okay. Is it any R or is it the right R? Uh, the, well, the, the R, alpha, I mean, alpha has to be between 0 and, and 2, right? So that for, for any R between, any alpha between 0 and 2, so the alpha still still stays the same. That means probably what can say just any for for the right alpha. So you have to choose the alpha from your problem you want to work with. That's yeah. right, but, but alpha yeah. depends on your problem, right? Yeah, so alpha depends on your problem. So, so it depends on whether, so you need to hypothesize that the variables in A come yeah. from some stable distribution <coughs> alpha, you know, with, with parameter alpha. But then it should be the case for any R, right? Yes. If I understood your formula correctly, yes. then B will also come from that same stable distribution. Yes. And the, so after, after the projection, yeah, you will get the stable distribution, stable random variables. So, so the only thing you need to do is to estimate the scale parameter. Once you could ask, if you could estimate it, then you're done with the stable random projections. Okay, so, so this, yeah, so the, so, the, so the problem amounts to estimating the scale parameter of stable distributions from you mean, K samples. You mean the alpha? I mean, the, the, you know the alpha, you, you pick alpha, so okay. estimating the scale parameter. The D. D, yeah. The D. Yeah. How many dimensions? And from K samples, yeah. So, so it becomes a statistic estimation problem. And uh, it's not straightforward to estimate it because uh, the first question to ask is, can we just estimate by the mean, by the sample mean like this? You, well, uh, uh, it's good, it's good estimator when alpha is equal to 2. So this is a great estimator. It's unbiased, and it's optimal, it's, it's the same as the maximum likelihood, and it's obvious. And it has this, uh, that we know the distribution, it's a gamma distribution, or chi-square. So we know the moments, so we know the tail bounds. And this, this famous L, lemma, this JL lemma, says we only need the k to be as small as like log n over epsilon square to get the arrows bounded by 1 plus minus epsilon. So, so we know everything about the L2 case. Yeah, so, so this is good. But as soon as alpha less than 2, so, so this thing doesn't work when alpha less than 1, but it doesn't work too well when alpha is between 1 and a 2. So we need to do a different estimator. And uh, well, we can always estimate the parameter by maximum likelihood because, uh, because we can represent the distribution by, by Fourier transform. So we can do maximum likelihood if you want. But which is not practical for this problem of this scale because we have to numerically evaluate the probability density except in three cases. And I work out the, the last case I recently worked out is very very beautiful results. I, I, I like I like it, but I, I, I don't want to present here. And uh, so people ask why we care about alpha go to zero. That corresponding to the Heminor. So people if people care about the Heminor, this this is good. So and uh, produce a very and this uh, maximum likelihood estimator is very good for that. But we propose estimators of simple estimators based on the geometrical mean. So this is estimator. Ignore the complicated denominator. If you look at only look at the numerator, is the geometrical mean of the sample, and uh, it's unbiased. And the denominator is complicated, but we can pre-compute it because it's just basically a bunch of gamma function, and it has very simple asymptotic form. And we know that when alpha equals one, this asymptotically become one, and uh, people are probably familiar with this constant. Just an Euler's constant. So, so this is the estimator we're using. We're recommending. I'm not okay. sure why you're also estimating alpha. Oh, because we picked alpha. Yeah. But, but uh, they may not be distributed that way, right? They're just given data. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. Just given data, you have to. Yeah. That that's a different problem. Yeah. It's a different problem. So you we just say you. Yeah, and estimating alpha is actually pretty pretty difficult. It's more difficult than estimating scale parameter. Yeah, and uh, it's a difficult. It's it's a different problem. Like uh, I present a table, people actually estimate this alpha. I mean, this this values. Yeah, but it's a different problem. So here we just say suppose we pick alpha equal to one, say L one, then what's the what's the estimator? 
Okay. So this is the estimator we're, we're, we're dealing with. Yeah, we're using. And uh, as I promised, the, the variance is it has this form, like a, the scale parameter to the square to turn and over k. So, and those little constants depend on alpha. Yeah. And, how, and then how good is this estimator? I said, well, if we, if we and the, I still have a worry about what is the variance? How good is that? So, so and we know that MLE is asymptotically optimal, so we just compare against the MLE. MLE is, in phys is not practical to do, but at least we can say theoretically how bad is it compared with MLE. So it will be always, a lot less, always worse than MLE, as, at least asymptotically, but we can, if we plot the efficiency, is this. That means, so the, the, the vertical axis, it goes to from 0 to 1, so the maximum is 1. You can do as good as 100% of the MLE. But when alpha is between like 0.6 to 1.1, it's 80% as good. And uh, if we were only interested in L1 norm, that means this is a very good estimator. And then in the worst case, like 0.4, so in the alpha equal to 2. But when alpha equal to 2, you don't, you, you don't use this. You use something simpler. OK. So all right. So for people who care about tail bounds, and we pro provide the tail bounds, exp the theoretical tail bounds, and uh, the, that means the, the estimated value compared with the original should be within epsilon fraction and has exponentially decay probabilities. So and, the, and I, I don't want to show, I don't want to express this explicitly because it's a complicated form, but we can plot them. So it's a reasonably small, small parameter for, for all alpha. So, good. so for people who care about JL lemmas from the exponential tail bounds, you can get the JL lemma says, well, we only need a k equal to logarithm n and over epsilon square. So that means you produce, you, we pro prove the JL type of lemma for all alpha. So this is a, all the theoretical results I want to say about it. And uh, so, uh, and we can, if you're interested in estimation, yeah, I'm happy to talk about it. But, go back to the same general, about this JL lemma. So uh, JL lemma said, yeah, maybe to read this. So that means using our estimator, as long as you're using k, is in the order of log n of epsilon square. So the L alpha distance between any pair, if you have n data points between any pair of the point, pairs of points, can be estimated within 1 plus minus epsilon factor. So k corresponds to the dimension to which you will Yeah, which dim how, many, how many dimensions you want to choose, yeah. Because the result that for L1 norms, there is no JLM at all. It's impossible to have one. Sorry? There's the result saying that for L1 norm, uh -huh. there's no JL lemma at all. Yes, that's exactly, so the, yeah, that's absolutely right. But I, I just say this is analogous. So that means as long as we just want, we just want to estimate the L alpha distance, whether or not this parameter, um, whether or not this estimator is a metric or not, I don't care. So this is not a metric. That's why, it's, that's why the, L, the JL lemma does not exist if we insist the estimator has to be a metric. Yeah, you, yeah. thank you for, for, yeah, I was trying to avoid not to talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but it's, it's not a metric. That means in some applications, it's not, it's not very good. But if you only care about distance, it's OK. But if you want to do like a, some applications, some applications require, requiring a metric, then it's not good. Thank you. How big is the constant in that hole? Uh, oh, the, the How big is the constant it gets oh, to be? And whether it's, uh, the constant is small, yeah. Well, but of course, I mean, epsilon. What about if you go to high dimensions, how does the histogram of L, L alpha distance scale with the dimension? It also goes to a drag function, you know? Yeah, the, the, that's, a very, that's a very good question. Like, and like we just say that epsilon, but epsilon contains lots of information. And uh, it's really up to the problem. When you're working with a specific problem, how to pick epsilon is a big, is a big problem. Yeah, theoretically, it's very beautiful. But I, the JL lemma has this problem. So how to pick an epsilon? Yeah, thank you for. That. Oh, for for the regarding the question, how small is the constant? The constant is related with this constant, which is very small. 
Yeah, like for that's why it's very useful. Otherwise, it's useless. Yeah. Thank you. So, so now, so now, where are we? So we we do the we do the co we do the stable random projections. And we estimate it. And we so we we so we're doing good. But now the problem is how to sample from a coding from stable distribution. You have to. This is a problem we have to address. So it's, it look quite simple. We just sample, like sample from uniform, then sample from exponential, then do this simple algebra. We get a distributed as a coach as a stable. Well, we don't want to do this. This is a, like this. This is horrible. So we want to do something much simpler. So. Yeah, so uh, so therefore, yeah, this is our recommendations. So is, instead of using doing this business, let's do the Prato, and uh, and with uh, with uh, do a Prato with uh, with a high sparsity. That means instead of uh, using S alpha one, we do so. So this distribution has lots of benefits. First, its sampling is much easier because you know how to get a state Prato. We just sample from uniform then. Then scale, and then raise to the power. We get we we get the Prato. And the the cost of computing the matrix multiplication is much reduced by the factor of beta, one of beta. So if beta is uh, like a point oh one, then reduced by uh, uh, like it's a hundred fold speed up. And the storing the R, storing the uh, matrix R is much reduced too. And why do you want to store the matrix? Well, the last reason you want to store it because, for example, the new data points may come and the data points may change, so that's that's why you want to store it. And it's it's actually a big storage cost, but this will reduce the cost very considerably. Okay, so this is what they look like. If you want to look read the red portion, so this is our 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 recommended distributions. So it has a Prato tail and a big point mass in the middle. So this will guarantee the will, will ensure the sparsity. Okay. So there are two fundamental reasons why this art looking thing should work. The reason, the first reason, is that the data should be reasonable. For example, when we're using the L1 this norm, we implicitly assume that the data has at least bounded first moments. Otherwise, this is pointless to do L L1 norm. And the second reason is that the dimension D is very large. Otherwise, there's no point doing dimension reductions. And when, uh, when D is so large, the asymptotic analysis becomes almost the exact analysis because D is so large. And the, another intuition is that we, because D is so large that you can afford to only use a fraction of the coordinates, like beta times D, and then do the projection on, on, on those coordinates. And then we, we repeat that k times. It's, uh, so, so this two fundamental reason why it works. But theoretical analysis is related to the uh, to the general to the to the to the generalized central limit theorem. Right? And uh, if probably not many people care much about it, that means if the so the projected data is still distributed as a stable with the same scale parameter, but with the same scale parameter. Multiply by a different scale parameter, a different scale, and the, the scale doesn't matter because you can always scale back. So as long as data has bounded off as moments, so this is a very natural requirement. And uh, if, and the, and the we can do a little bit better if we know, if if we know that data has more than alpha as moments. For example, like when the data has bounded second moments and alpha is less than one. Then we can choose a beta so small, like one of square root of d, that the rate is still very large. As it's the rate is still very fast. So it's all about the trade-off of the rate convergence and also um, uh, the sparsity, and uh, and all critically depend on how large d is. So that's why it works. So, so is the take-home message that if the uh, if if the higher moments are bounded. The higher moments exist, uh -huh. and in fact, actually, you can get away with more sparse representations. Yes, yes. Is that true? Yeah. And uh, the more the more higher moments, of course, uh, once it's larger than two, larger than higher, larger than second, higher than second moments, then it doesn't doesn't so help anymore. Yeah. But yeah, but before that, the more 
the more higher moments you have, the most sparsity you can afford. Yeah. So that's uh, uh, yeah. So this, I, I show this results in the for the for the for the for the people already know the uh, know this kind of results for uh, for the I, for the IID case when the the when the R is one. I mean the U is one. So it's well known in the actually in the 1920s or 30s, and Alex probably is all from Russian. <laughs> yeah. And uh, but when uh, when it studied the rates of convergence. When, when the U is not, because we need to consider U is non-IID. So that's the theoretical, a little bit theoretical part, is that when the starting the rate of co convergence mm -hmm. in the non-IID case, if, yeah, so. So the U's here are going to be like features or something else like that, in your, and of course you wouldn't expect those to be IID, right? No, it, because, uh, yeah, it's not going to be IID, yeah. So, yeah, but I, yeah, I, I wrote that in the preprint, yeah. So, so the, the experimental results we want to look at is uh, that we already see this Harvard microarray data. And uh, the another data I'd like to look at is uh, let's do a syndactic data when the data are eta Pareto and the test data is a 0 0.1, 0 0.5 and, and eta is a 2. And also try to do some Microsoft MS and web crawl data. So this is the uh, experiments for the syndactic data. Let's look, look at only this form, th this part. That means that the data I follow the Pareto is a heavy tail, but because of this parameter eta is true, that means it's pretty, it's, it's pretty decent. Then I can afford very small beta. So beta here is a like point, like almost like a minus a three quarters. So it's a very, very, very small beta, but still get very good results. So the results here is like sample size as and versus like a, the mean square error. And uh, the theoretical curve means the curve is using stable distributions, using um, using stable distributions, and uh, so, so other curves corresponding to like d is like hundred, d is a thousand, d is five hundred. We can see that we can see that we can afford this very sparse projections when d is like a five hundred or thousand. So we don't need d very large to get good results for the, for this case. Doesn't that to hide some terrible result from zero to ten, or uh, the sample size of five, for example? Yeah. So, so with less than ten, yeah, it's uh, it's just just yeah increase, okay. and the uh, and the uh, so the point is that it's actually it's, it matches our theoretical predictions. So theoretical predictions uh, is this is it's an overlap with it. So so yeah, certainly yeah, when when the case less than ten, yeah, and and and. Uh, and I did not plot that because I want to see here. Otherwise, you cannot see. <laughs> you cannot see this part. <laughs> yeah. All right. Can you remind where the theoretical predictions are coming from? Sorry. So, uh, can, can you remind us where the theoretical predictions are coming from? Uh, theoretical predictions. Uh, theoretical predictions assume that the data are. Uh, here we're, we're 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 talking about the L1 L1 norm. So assume that the data are exactly uh, are Cauchy. I mean, the projections are Cauchy projections, and then we know the variance of Cauchy projections. So this is the theoretical curve for the Cauchy projections. And uh, so the point is that using sparse projections will actually actually match the Cauchy projections. Even, yeah, even so, so such a sparse conditions. Uh, yeah, for this, but this is just theoretical data. For non-theoretical data, like uh, I mean, non-theoretical data, this uh, web crawl data shows so two pairs of words, and uh, and uh, because the data are heavy, heavy tailed, especially for this, uh, this this two pairs, and the dimension is sixty-five thousand, and I use uh, try different beta values, like 0 0.1, 0 0.01, 0 .1, and eventually, as case we expect that eventually going to break. But when beta is a 0.01, that basically corresponding to one over d to the 0.6, 0.4, so which is a, which is still very sparse, and get a very, very close results. Wait, just to the data in this case was number of documents by number of words. What is the word count or count? Uh, yeah, the the count. That means the documents, the the count. That's a that the document contains the word. Yeah, and I did. I yeah contain that word. I mean, no. The, the 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 how many times the word occur in that document? Yeah. So this is obviously a very heavy tail distribution, 
and uh, if we, yeah, it's, it's a highly heavy tail distribution. And another reason it doesn't work too well for this case is because it's much sparser. So the, yeah, so the D is not, actually it's not that D, yeah. So, so can you just say some more about what this is? So what, so D there is, D is the, D is the vocabulary, right? Number so of documents? A number of documents. Number of documents. Yeah. So there are only two rows here, yeah? Yeah, only two rows. So. And it, yeah, only two rows. So. So these number of documents and the, uh, and the uh, only two rows, like this and a half, like two two rows. So that means that the data are the number of occurrences of that word in that document, in each one of uh, the documents. So most of them are, some of them will be zeros. Actually, maybe ten, ninety percent of them are zeros, but lots of them, lots of documents that contain very big numbers occur in big num, big number of times. Yeah. So it's a. Uh, yeah. So what's the, what's the, the MCO? I guess I'm confused. Yeah. Oh, MSO, MS. Sorry. What's the square error of, of, of yeah. what? What's the distance? I'm, I'm confused. Oh, sorry. Between yeah, I said the distance is the the L1 distance. Yeah. Between, between the two words. Between the two words. So, so with, with without samples, you either have yeah. everything or you have. Oh, just between the two rows of yeah. the uh, two rows. So, so okay. if you looked at the full matrix, or if you look at some estimate based on some sampling, I say, all right, now what's the error that's introduced by doing the sampling versus yeah. doing the tracing? Yeah, the between the two two words. So the L one distance between the two words, yeah. and we can we can afford like a, a very high sparsity. So that's the that's the point. So all of these are reasonably low IDF words. I mean, if you try looking at the words which are present in very few documents, which are very smart to begin with. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that, that's a very reasonable concern. And uh, the, the reason is that because it, when the data are extremely sparse, the, the dimension is actually not, it's not, not what you see anymore. It's the dimension is actually much smaller. So you actually really need to think about the dimension in the actual, actual dimension instead of the uh, the the uh, apparent dimension, yeah. So, so you mean to say the actual dimension is the number of occupied columns? Yeah, case, yes, right? number of non zero columns, basically, yeah. And if, so if the columns are zero for yeah, both, yeah. both words, you're saying it's really not there. Yeah, because the signal is very weak, much weaker now, so your estimation becomes harder, yeah. yeah. So it's, uh, it, yeah. That's where the second part of the talk that we're not going to get to is important. Yeah, it's going to be a, it's, it's going to be a problem for the extremely sparse word. But my, my guess is that even even for that extremely sparse, you can afford like a point one, yes. like ten percent, like ten ten for improvement is still going to be considerable. But the gap would become bigger. Like you would not be able to have that low beta if it's very very sparse. Right? Yeah. No. It's yeah. Yeah. But for for that, you you don't really need you don't need really need to do sparse projections, right? <laughs> yeah. So so that's yeah. Okay. So. Should I move on or do I have a problem with this image? Okay. We already seen this, so I won't do it. So, so let's quickly move to the, what is the limitation of doing stable random projections? First, it does not take advantage of data sparsity, as everyone already <coughs> know about. It's, it, it's so, so, that's, so that's a part we have a problem with. As only for the L alpha distance, and suppose you do the L, L2 projections, it's not going to work for the L1. So you have to start over for every alpha, and so so that's not good. And it's only going for it's going it's only going for for, for the pairwise distances, because. And this, but some of the application like database we want like multi-way distances, and it's not going to be applicable here. And, uh, and the, in some other papers we, we wrote that it actually works poorly for this most important case, and I yeah I can tell you offline why it works poorly. So, uh, so because this this limitations, so we want to move on to a to a better scheme, which is designed for sparse data. So this is another scheme called conditional random sampling, and the work start actually with the Broder's work, and uh, in 1997, this is considered as a seminal work. So, so he's he do this for approximating the pairwise resemblance distance. And uh, he applied that for clustering the web pages and remove duplicates in the uh, Alta Vista uh, collections. And the later they moved they, they move to the meanwhile sketch, which is uh, we consider as a, we view that as a sample with a replacement variant. And it's 
and uh, but in 2005, we, uh, I and Ken had a paper, and uh, developed this and extend this broader sketches to an like, example contingency tables. That means instead of estimating resemblance, we estimate contingency tables, and they actually reduce the variance by ha by a factor of half, a uh, factor of two. Then later we extend that to multi-way associations. So this is going to appear in computation linguistics, and recently. The, the work on NIPS is about the general data, how to use this scheme for like a real value data and the histograms and the multi-way L alpha norms. So, so this is how it works. So suppose we start with a sparse matrix. And the, so each col the color means it's non-zero. And each the col column has the same color. So it's a highly, suppose it's highly sparse. I cannot draw highly sparse, but suppose it's highly sparse. And the first thing to do is do a random permutation of the columns. And uh, so, and then we just store all the non-zeros. So we group all the non-zeros together called postings. And then we don't store the postings completely, at least in memory. So let's cut off the posting nest. It doesn't have to be straight line, but I was told that it's better to use a straight line in the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so let's use a straight line. So then we just get the sketches. So, so you can see that the color, the, so each column, they have different colors. That means they're from different columns. So they're not the random coordinate sampling we're familiar with. So, but, and the, so, we, so we're going to show that how to get the random coordinate samples from sketches, which is basically the front approach tense. So it's a procedure. Okay. Okay. So, so let's look, look at a more concrete example. So suppose we have data matrix. Let's only look at two rows. So, so the, suppose the column are already randomly permuted, and the, so, so the data are highly sparse, suppose, and has some a few non-zeros. And then we, because we don't need to store the zeros, so let's store only the non-zeros. So we need to use the ID, which is the, the column ID, and the value, which is the, the value in that, uh, uh, that entry, in that column. So two and three means the second column, the value is three. So they are equivalent, obviously, because the rest of them are zeros. Then this is, of course, people use that every day for, as an inverted index. And uh, and uh, so let's let's say how to do how do we, how do we do sampling? So first first let's look at how do we do like random coordinate sampling? So suppose so this is uh, the data matrix. So the the original data matrix. In order to to get a random coordinate sample, because they're already randomly permuted, so the only thing, so the simple thing you can do is let's take the front, like a DS like ten columns as random coordinate samples. So this is a perfect random sample random coordinate sample. But we don't do that. We do we, we, we work with the sketches. So so this is the postings. The whole thing is the posting, but the sketches are the blue box. So the blue box are our sketch. And we compare the sketch with the with the with the blue box here. That's a green. Not color blinded. It's a color it's a green. It's a green box. And we can see that they're almost identical, except if we remove the, the last elements, like 11, 3, they will be identical. They're identical because the rest of them are zeros. So let's, let's see why they're identical. Let's take an example like column 10, the value of 2, and column A has a value of 1, and the rest of them are zeros. So they are actually identical. That means if we just take the minimum of the last column ID in the 10, 11, which is 10, so it's equivalent to sample from the first ten, first 10 columns of the permuted data matrix. So, so now we just obtain a random sample of size 10 from sketches only size 5. And when, when the sample, when the data are much more sparse, so this, this, this ratio of 10 over 5 can be maybe, 10, maybe become much more significant. So we use a small sketch to get a big size of random samples. So that's a fact to reduce the variance because the sample is much larger equivalently. And the, but we have to do this, but we don't know the sample size in advance. Only during the estimation stage we know that. But before that we don't know. That's why I call it conditional random sampling. 
is all the analysis is conditional on the sample size, which we do not know beforehand. And we have to do this trick every, every pair. So it's pairwise uh, random. It's not globally random, it's pairwise random. And so the sample size is different pairwise. So this is why it takes advantage of the sparsity in an adaptive pairwise manner. And it doesn't have to be pairwise. It can be like a three-way wise. Okay. So, so that's why it's flexible, because you get random samples. And we know the statistics become much easier when you have random samples. And if people can do, then we can do statistics on top of conditional random sampling. And uh, so, uh, for example, we can do smoothing, we can do Bayesian analysis, since we have random samples from sketches. So, so that's the so that's advantage we consider. Well, how do you, how, then, next question, how do we estimate? Well, which is very easy. Because we contain the condition random sample pairwise, and then we just compute the summary statistics, sample summary statistics from the conditional random samples and multiply by d over ds. What's different? ds is different pairwise. So we do this estimation pairwise. So ds different pairwise, but it doesn't doesn't matter because we only care about pairwise or, or three way three three, three way wise or four way wise. So and the the thing I'm not going to talk about is that we can actually uh, improve the estimates, often considerably, by taking advantage of the margins. Yeah, we, we had a couple of papers on that, but I'm not going to talk about it here. And uh, what, what I want to show you is that it actually works more accurately than stable random projections. So, for example, in the Boolean data case, and ignore what the neighbor says, just says uh, the value is always less than one. That means the variance is less than, uh, less than one. The reason why it works better than the stable random projections is that the stable random projections may be choosing zero, zero count columns. Is that right? Uh, sparse. Right? Yeah, that's sparse. Is that right? Yeah, the stable random projection they, they don't consider the sparsity. There's no matter what your data is, I, I will give you, and um, I will I will give you good estimates. In other words, you you you. you Ahead of time, you decide which columns you're going to compare yeah, on. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And they so, just have zero counts. Yeah. So this is the price you pay if you, yeah, if you don't you don't know don't have the prior knowledge of the data. Right. Okay. So so that's why it works. I just want to check with people. Um, you've got a bit more to go, right? Uh, yeah, maybe five more minutes. Yeah. Oh, five more minutes. Five. five yeah. Minutes. Yeah. So, so in the Boolean data, and it's 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 the people. So I hope you convinced that it's actually it's always more, more accurate than stable random projection. Because Boolean data, they're not so heavy tail. They're very sparse. And uh, it's, it's actually a lot better in Boolean data. And for, for the empirical, da empirical comparison, this is an NSF abstract data. So it works like overwhelmingly better. Because that data set is highly sparse. And uh, of course, we only choose the favor favorable data sets to compare with. So, so, so for that data sets, and we compare with the L1 projection and as well as the L2 projections. And it works like overwhelmingly better. This, so this number means 99.95% of the pairs, uh, conditional random sampling gives better results. Yeah, OK. So yeah, should I just skip this? Or? So uh, for, for people who are familiar with the broader sketches, yeah, I put lots of words here. So, so broader sketches is for removing duplicate pages in Alta Vista, which is uh, like uh, 30 million pages at that time. Now it's much more. And uh, he, he did similar things. So he parsed the data uh, for each page to form shingles, which is a, which is a, which is a set in this, in, this, in, this, uh, in this set, which is a subset of this set. So it's basically a Boolean data for, 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 com uh, for broader sketches. And so he, he defined the similarity as a, as a resemblance, which is a union over, I mean, intersection over union. So here, the intersection, we can represent by the intersection and the margins. So he generated a uh, general random permutation, as we did. Then he stored the k smallest, the k smallest of the permuted sets as, as a sketches. And he used this complicated form. And it took me a while to understand why this works. But it's a very clever idea. So this is an unbiased estimator of the resemblance. 
It's a, yeah. So maybe more, more concrete, so, so let's see example. So let's suppose, so P1, P2 are, are postings, and they're already permuted. And then we take the sketch as the first of seven, so K is a seven in this case. So this is a broader sketches. Because, because it's in Boolean data, we only need the ID number, so it's, the value is zero, and the value is one. So, and the, so, Boolean, so broader sketch is K1 and K2, so basically in the blue box. And he used this uh, operation called min K operation, means a K1 over union K2, and takes the smallest K of it. And it's basically throw away half of the samples. In order to get an unbiased estimate, they have to throw away half of the samples. Then, after, after that, he estimated the, uh, the, the resemblance at 1 over 7. So, so the key is that he only used half of the samples and the, in order to get an unbiased estimator. And what do we do? We, do, we, do we, we still do the same permutation, and we do the same sketch. However, we get a conditional sample size, like ds equal minimum of 18, which is 18 over 19. I mean, 18 or 21, so it's 18. We, so therefore, we remove 19 and 21. After we remove that, we get a conditional random samples. So therefore, we're using, we're using like 12 samples instead of seven. So we always use more samples. That's why we get better estimates. And, the, and the, notice that we, we, in our scheme, we can use different, different sample size because there's no restriction in our scheme. But in, in broader sketches, they have to use the same because otherwise the theoretical analysis is going, is, is, is going to be a problem. So, so this is a theoretical comparison that our method is much better, it's less than one, because the, the various theoretical variance is less than one, and the ratio of theoretical variance is less than one. And uh, empirically, we improve the mean square, mean square errors by like a six, like a, for example, 50% or 70% or 80% for empirical data. You can only improve 100%. So if you, once you improve 80%, it's probably very good. So, so a little bit summary is that in Boolean data, our algorithm uses the same sketching, but condition random sampling is sharper estimates by having the variance roughly. And it does not require fixed sample size. And this CRS naturally works for general real value data. And it also naturally works for the motorway, motorway data. And it's probably hard to define what is a multi-way resemblance. But for multi-way association, it's very natural. And the CIS can be viewed as general purpose sampling algorithm. It can replace the usual random coordinate sampling, and we can do things on top of that. So this is a, a lot to talk to today. And the, I still have to sum, um, summary or summaries. So, so some of the talk is that we have too much data, but also not, not, not enough. And the distance-based methods are popular, and so it's often necessary to consider uh, L alpha norm other than L2 norms because that are heavy tail. And the exact computation is not feasible, too time consuming. So two methods we propose are useful for compact data represent representations and efficiently computing the distances. And the, the naive random coordinate sampling does not work too well because the data are often heavy tail or, ha or highly sparse. And uh, we propose two methods, stable random projection and conditional random sampling. And our recommendation is a stable random, uh, conditional random sampling is going to be good for, for sparse, larger sparse data. And stable random projections, and conditional random sampling is recommended for larger sparse data. And stable random projections, uh, the beautiful theories and uh, how, how useful is that, I think it depends on applications. So that's it. So, Thank you very much.